day, but over the last couple of weeks, we've seen it bounce up about 12% uh, and up 6% this week alone. So some of those big tech names, we're seeing some money uh, move into them, Tim. Yeah, it's interesting. Even though we are getting a buy toward the close for much of the day, the S&P 500 was in this relatively narrow range of about 1%, struggling for direction a lot of the day, moving between gains and losses at least 10 times today. Really interesting. I think that sort of just speaks to the volatility, uh, Caroline, of course, that is still underway in these markets. We've talked a lot about the VIX and Katie sort of hovering down, not spiking up the way that we'd seen in previous weeks of blowing up above a 30 handle. And a volatility is measured by the move index as it relates to bonds really um, sort of outperforming, if you will, some of the volatility within the equity market. It is fascinating to see those two asset classes diverge in terms of volatility, in terms of performance, too. But like you said, Taylor, I mean, bond volatility is going up, stock volatility is going down. I want to know which reverts first. Yeah, is it the bond market where everyone always tries to say it's smarter, but $2.6 trillion route on the global bond market. I mean, it has been a pain trade for Q1. Meanwhile, we count you down just 17 seconds until this market closes. The bells ring, the euphoria is there for a Friday, which sees as though the S&P 500 does manage to push on up by five tenths of percent, actually hitting more the higher end of the trading range for the day. 23 points to the upside, 4,544, let's call it, is where we trade. On the upside also is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, up more than four tenths of percent. That means that the Dow is currently on a five-day the laggard up three tenths of percent on a five day, with the S&P up 1.8 percent. The outperformer on five days is actually the Nasdaq. It's down for the day off by, well, almost two tenths of percent, 22 points lower, but on a five day basis, up almost two percentage points for the Nasdaq. Let's pull out, let's see where the small caps manage to find its day's trade, because the Russell 2000 also in the green, but only by a tenth of a percent. Taylor, what? what? Carol. Oh, yeah. No, where? Or me? You, Carol. Hey, <laughs> so, Carol. Sorry, it's I always get that one wrong. <laughs> it's okay. It's a little bit crazy. I mean, come on, right? We're all dealing with so much. Hey, you guys, we were just talking about volatility, and I was uh, checking out the volatility index, the VIX. You know, moving back almost uh, down a full point, and it's down about three points this week, Taylor. So we are seeing some complacency come back into the market, despite the, you know, swings we see on a daily basis. It is interesting to see the VIX back off again, but makes sense, right, considering the equity gains. Certainly. And, you know, Carol, when you talk about the equity gains, we're certainly seeing that on a sector level as well. For the radio audience, the sector winners, the sector losers, and we dive down two sectors to sort of give you a broad-based view, view of what is really going on. And Carol, it feels pretty risk-on, right? It's energy, it's banks, it's those financials, food and tobaccos. You think about some of those inflationary hedges, you're up anywhere from about 1.2% to 2.3% on the day alone. There's not a whole lot of losers today, speaking perhaps to me to the broad-based rally, even though volumes don't feel very high. But for some of the losers, I think what's notable is it's really concentrated, Carol, within the tech sector, yeah. software, auto components, and semiconductors, but they're only off about one half of 1%. All right, so you set up all of the uh, major groups that have uh, certainly seen some gains today. I'm going to continue with that thought, some of the gainers that I picked out here. Uh, energy, you know, Taylor, you talk about this so much, and it makes sense, and certainly today on a day when we saw the U.S. and the EU talking about a deal when it comes to LNG and gas going from the United States in to the European Union. So E&P names, particularly in the gas sector, definitely gaining. So Katerra Energy, this was top uh, in the S&P 500. It was up about 7%, uh, and we've seen it kind of move up about 20% in the past week alone. Also wanted to take you to a name that was top uh, in the NASDAQ 100. Uh, this company announcing a 4 for one stock split. And we're talking about Dexcom. This stock was up about 2.7% uh, in the trade today. And then Miss and Romaine, no, he's traveling, having a good time. We're happy for him, but he likes those small caps. <laughs> and this name was definitely uh, a standout for me. The ticker is Hook, and it's a pronounced Hukipa. It's top in the Russell uh, 1000, and it's up about 10%. It was up as much as 27% in today's uh, trade. I'm not quite sure why. Quarterly updates yesterday it missed uh, on the EPS line, did, meet, uh, did beat on revenues, and even RBC coming out, cutting its uh, price target, but did maintain its outperform, but nonetheless, just thinking of Remain, hoping he's bringing you some You got a croissants. week without him interrupting you, Carol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's busy swigging champagne it's over in gay sweet. Paris. <laughs> just hoping he brings back croissants and red wine. That's exactly, all yeah. I'm asking. All right, Tim, what do you Yeah, got? looking forward to that. Uh, you got the gainers, Carol. I got the decliners. Let's start with the Honest Company. Shares singing today, down more than 20 2.5% uh, uh, trading at $4.68. Uh, having its actual uh, reaching levels, uh, the worst levels ever, uh, not even just a 52-week low, worst level 
levels ever. All-time low for the company's stock. Down at more than 70% from the IPO back in May. Um, this after the personal care company reported fourth quarter results that missed expectations and gave an outlook that is seen as disappointing. And then an activist story today. Uh, Huntsman Corporation shares falling 11%. The chemical company falling the most in about two years after a starboard value uh, fell short in its efforts to revamp the board of, Huntsman, of Huntsman's. Uh, the investors there rejecting its nominees. And then Carvana, the online car purchase, used car purchasing platform, uh, down 13.5%. After Wedbush analyst estimated wider losses than he had previously thought for the online car selling company, he wrote a note, quote, deteriorating credit and affordability trends increase near-term challenges. Mm, tell you what's had near-term challenges of late. If we go across asset in the FX market, it's been the yen under significant pressure. Actually, for today, we see a little bit of a reprieve in yen selling. We're actually up two tenths of a percent. But the yen has been under so much pressure because of the Federal Reserve that looks far more hawkish in the Bank of Japan, and also oil prices that are leading into that as well. Interestingly, oil prices really dictating what's happening in the FX market. Canadian dollar, the loony up five tenths of a percent. The Norwegian kroner outperformer on the back of the week, as we see for the first time ever, actually. For the first time in three weeks, oil gaining on the week. Now, this is as we see supply side concerns with Saudi Arabia. We look at, you know, Houthi rebels in Yemen potentially being an impact there. We also see, of course, this on again, off again concern about whether indeed we will see some sort of impact of sanctions on oil and energy over in Russia. We hold back on it today. Certainly we hear from Europe that that's not the way they're going. But instead, they look to find some sort of reprieve in the gas price spike over in Europe. That means natural gas in the US rises 2.7% as liquefied natural gas is going to find a new home in Europe, we understand. And we could indeed paint a prettier demand picture here in the United States. I'm looking, though, overall at still prices on the upside. Zinc up four tenths percent. Interesting note coming from Goldman Sachs really saying, look out for further potential for the likes of aluminium, zinc, copper to rally on the back of Russia, Ukraine. And meanwhile, I look at a sovereign bond market that once again is a global sell-off, Canadian bond sell-off, Norwegian. We see Japanese, the Danish, the Aussie. I mean, from Asia to Europe to the US, we're seeing real pressure in yields going higher, Taylor. You see that certainly within the US, Carol, with full faith and credit. And I think our wonderful producers are going to pull up the weekly moves because this is pretty unbelievable when you think, Carol, about where we have come in just one week alone. I think we know for the two-year yield, we're up about 35 basis points on the week. That is now the biggest weekly move higher since 2008. So that really sort of puts this wow. move into perspective. Mm. The 10-year yield, uh, yield for the week, we're matching the biggest sort of move higher that we've had since 2019. Before that, you've done, again, all the way go back to about 2016. So we're in sort of different territory here, and this sort of kicks us off into our big conversation, not only about the Federal Reserve, as we've talked a lot about how they sort of tackle this, and sort of the economic data that we're going to get next week in the face of some of these challenges. Right. How do we take that economic data that we get next week, right? What's the big story here? There's so many conflicting, I feel like, themes and opinions at this point, Katie. You know, there's people who are positive on the market. We just had Ryan Dietrich on over at LPL Financial, and he is very optimistic about the outlook and, and thinks you should be, you know, putting some money to work in those cyclical value names. There's other folks who said, uh-uh, time out, you know, put cash on the sidelines, wait to ride this out. So it's hard to say, Katie. I mean, personally speaking, all eyes on the jobs report. I mean, mm. that, I feel, as we've been talking about stagflation, I feel like for weeks, if you have a labor market as hot as it has been in the U.S., that kind of really puts the, some of those fears to rest. And I mean... A lot hinges on this report. 485,000 is the number that economists surveyed by Bloomberg are estimating right now. We expect that to change over the next few days. It would be a decline from the 678,000 that we saw in the most recent. Do we believe report. any of the estimates anymore? I mean, the consensus is so yeah, and the wide. range the range is really big too. Um, look, I, I, look, nobody knows what's happening in this market. I, I want to know what the next hawkish note we're going to get from one of the banks about uh, what the Fed is going to do because I don't know how you top six. Know today. Yeah, I mean, we've had Goldman come out, Citigroup, I think Morgan Stanley's a note that in the last few days we've been mentioning, and uh, Katie had mentioned sort of the WIRP function as well. When you take a look at the swaps and mm. sort of really now pricing in about eight additional or eight total, we should say, here for the year. 
Carol, just though on the flip side of that, yeah. you get calls then from BlackRock saying maybe the dividends are the place to be, and that feels defensive. And I keep thinking about what Peter Cheer said, that maybe the Fed's already missed the curve. They were so behind it. And then now what you really have to worry about is moves that the Fed does that slows down an already slowing economy. So uh, there's lots of discussions. Uh, fingers crossed we get some developments uh, on the war in Ukraine. Uh, we will certainly be watching it over the weekend. All right, guys, that's a wrap for our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, and YouTube. Have a safe weekend. We'll see you all again on Monday. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. It's going to be another busy week. It always is. Yeah. No, it's good. Keeps us busy. Keeps us uh, on our toes. What? Uh, three tenths of a percent for the last five days in the Dow for the week. One point eight percent higher on the Nasdaq on the S and P five hundred. For the week me. overall. For the week overall, and two percent on the Nasdaq. So we've got two back to back weeks of gains, right? For the S and P and the Nasdaq. Yeah. Yeah. So some some big bounce again. Dead cat bounce. Bear market rally. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. TBD. So let's get to Nancy Lyons for Checker World and National News. She's in our 991 newsroom in D.C. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Tim. President Biden is in Poland along its border with Ukraine. Among his stops today was a visit to a base barber shop where he spoke with U.S. troops. Hey, guys, how are you? Good to see you, man. Before leaving Brussels for Poland, President Biden and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced a joint task force to reduce Europe's reliance on Russian energy. This initiative focuses on two core issues. One, helping Europe reduce its dependency on Russian gas as quickly as possible. And secondly, reducing Europe's demand for gas overall. Biden says the U.S. has agreed to help provide Europe with an extra 15 billion cubic meters of liquefied natural gas this year. Democratic lawmakers are working on legislation to provide funding for testing, treating, and vaccinating against COVID-19. And the GOP point person for negotiations is Republican Senator Mitt Romney. Democrats sent their latest proposal on how to offset the cost of a COVID-19 spending bill to Senator Romney. He says they're, quote, making progress. This after a $15.6 billion proposal fell through when House Democrats objected to a plan to use $7 billion in stimulus aid that would have otherwise gone to state and local governments. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says negotiators have to figure out a way to offset the bill to get the bill passed. She also says the longer they take, the costlier it will be. In Washington, I'm Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas was discharged from the hospital today after a stay of nearly a week for flu-like symptoms. Global news 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nance, thank you so much. So a lot going on this week. We know that. And we just thought we need a little bit of a mental break. And this story just made us chuckle. And we're hoping it makes you chuckle as well. I think you saw it on Twitter, Carol. And I did. During one of the breaks. And you just couldn't keep it together. I was like, Tim, um, Tim, Tim. We Tim. have to do this. Okay, so this story coming to us from Protocol, Allison Levitsky, uh, who seemed to find that uh, somehow that Google is taking away the bidets. What? that they have at their office, the heated bidet toilet seat. So Brought for those people Toto. who aren't familiar... Toto brand Yeah, they're bidets. made by Toto, yes. these ones. For people who aren't familiar with these, uh, they are heated toilet seats, and they spray water. You sound like someone who knows. Yeah, well, I have one. <laughs> I have one, too. I know you do. <laughs> so early on in our, in our partnership... We discovered our this was our bonding actually. mutual ownership of the Toto bidet toilet seat. We knew we were going to get along after that. <laughs> well, it turns I didn't know they had these at Google. Uh, I didn't either. But uh, there's a regulatory issue. Yeah. With um, them being forced to remove them. Yeah. So this is its California offices. They discovered that they were out of compliance with the state's code of commercial buildings, um, and so I guess this has to do with. What was the exact protocols? I guess according to a maintenance ticket reviewed by protocol, Google has started removing them. And the building code, let's just see, what is it about? The, yeah. Environmental and hygienic, well, we know that's the reason that they're, they're there. It has something to do with water, didn't it? Well, yeah, they're going to start using recycled water. Yeah. And that's, that's a uh, no -no. Well, not compatible with uh, bidets. No, exactly. Which makes sense. Yeah. I mean, come on, we know how this What works. a benefit for an office. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, if you've traveled to Japan, uh, and these are very popular in Hawaii as well, 
uh, then you'll notice that even public restrooms have these. We, after running out of toilet paper during the pandemic, even the subway, like, the subways in Kyoto have yeah. heated bidet toilet seats. Yeah, it's a big thing. Like it's been over in Europe for years, yeah. right? Like it's just kind of the norm. Anyway, um, and Google of the, offices and some of the yeah, but no more, alas. No. And apparently, uh, a lot of Google employees, it seems like, are pretty upset about it. Anyway, you learn something new every day. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We begin with a developing story headline from the Bloomberg Professional Service. NASA is delaying the next SpaceX crew flight to the space station to April 19th. Stocks rose, choppy day of trading. Dip buyers came in in the final few minutes of trading. S&P up 23 points today, up by about five tenths of one percent. The Dow was up 153, a gain of four tenths. NASDAQ down at 22, for the NASDAQ Composite Index to drop today 
today of just about two tenths of one percent. For the week, though, another winning week. Two in a row. S&P this week up 1.8 percent. The Dow this week up by three tenths of one percent. NASDAQ this week up by two percent. Ten-year yield 2.48 percent. Two-year yield 2.28 percent. Spot gold down one tenth of one percent. 1954 the ounce. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil up three tenths of one percent. 112.75 a barrel. And we have got uh, Brent, the global benchmark, up three tenths of one percent, 119.43 a barrel. An energy security deal between the U.S. and the European Commission could help jumpstart almost a dozen stalled American liquefied natural gas projects. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Well, if you talk with CEOs, and in addition to labor concerns, supply chain constraints, overall volatility, the one thing that often pops up that they are most concerned about, it's engaging and serving their customers. And Tim, our next guest knows a lot about that thanks to her company. Karen Peacock is the CEO of Intercom. She joins us on the phone from the San Francisco Bay Area. Karen, how are you? I am doing well. Great to be here, Carol and Tim. It's good to have you with us. I want to just start by introducing uh, Peacock to our audience. Um, they don't need an introduction necessarily because they've used it whether or not they know they've used it. But how do they interact with it on a daily basis, whether they know it or not? Yeah, thanks for asking. So Intercom is fundamentally the best way for companies to talk to their customers. And so if you're on a website and you see a chat bubble in the corner, that might be Intercom. If you're um, reaching out to a company and you need uh, strong support, if you're in a product with a company and they are, are reaching out to you in a real-time contextual way, there's a good chance that that's Intercom. And we think of ourselves as an engagement OS, really helping companies convert customers helping them engage their customers, helping those customers be successful, and helping them support their customers. And we work with about 25,000, actually more than 25,000 wow. companies, including folks like Amazon, Atlassian, Lyft, Shopify, and more. Yeah, a lot of them. So talk about the growth in your business and your, and your client acquisition. What kind of trends have you seen? You know, we started as a startup selling mm -hmm. to other startups. And the problem that we solved, exactly as you highlighted, helping companies engage customers, connect with their customers, what we realized is every company needs to care deeply about that. And in fact, mid-market and enterprise companies have even uh, bigger needs there. And so we've been steadily moving up market and selling more and more to mid-market and enterprise companies. And that's how we've ended up with, uh, with new customers like Amazon, customers like Atlassian and Lyft and others. And we should just, to be fair, uh, you've got some backing from the likes of Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, certainly well-known names to our audience. Hey, Karen, um, what is the best way to grow from selling to other startups to selling to the big players that you mentioned, like Amazon and more? Like, how, how, is it, is it so, word of mouth? How, how does it work? Yeah, I think it starts by having a real focus on customers and spending time understanding what are the most important problems they're, they're trying to solve and helping them do that and helping them do that in a way that's not 10% better, but that's three to four times better, 10 times better than what they've done in the past. And that really comes down to having a great product and a great um, customer-oriented mindset to make sure that they're getting all the value um, that they can. Well, you mentioned 25,000 and counting customers, uh, and you said, you know, whether it's Amazon, Shopify, uh, others, smaller companies, mid-sized companies, bigger companies, what is it when you talk with these customers? What's top of mind for your customers when it comes to their needs for serving their own customers? Great question. And what they're really looking for is um, a way to build a strong relationship with their customers, mm. to make it not just kind of a one-time transaction, but to really build trust and to build that ongoing relationship, which makes their customers want to come back and buy more with them, do more with them, makes them want to recommend uh, that company to other people. And that's part of our, our real focus at Intercom is moving from a world where companies in the past have just sent out tons and tons of spam email. I'm sure you, you both get a lot of that. Um, spam phone calls now, a lot of uh, uh, spam direct mail, a lot of that I, I personally don't even bring into my house. I just go straight to the recycling there. Yeah. And what we do and what companies are looking to typically do is figure out a more personal relationship with customers and reach out in ways that really are good for the customer and good for the company. Well, explain that to me because I do. I'm at a point where 
first of all, I'm tired when I buy something that I automatically get a survey and like rate my service. I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting overwhelmed. Like I haven't even used it yet. <laughs> and then, yes. and Tim and I both looked at each other and it's like, man, some of those bots, they like drive us crazy. I get on a website and, and they, I don't find them helpful. It's, there was a joke that went around last week. It was like, close the pop-up that comes up if you want to save 50%. No, you don't need live help. Uh, and yes, accept the cookies, right? <laughs> so, All the things you have to do when you go and visit a website now. So how is this Absolutely. evolving? Tell us about how it's evolving in terms of some of the offerings that you have um, or that your clients are using. Yeah, so so what we've really... Uh, is it getting better, system, more friendlier to customers? Yes. <laughs> it's getting more personalized and more in context. So rather than, than uh, a world where you have to just spam people, we believe that the best time to talk to someone or engage them is when they're already thinking about you. Not when it's hours later or uh, days later and they're trying to do something else and clear out their inbox. So right after you've used the product, then asking a question about how did you like it, what's working or not. When you have a problem with something like a, a support need, don't make the customer have mm. to like hunt down a phone number and wait on hold. Mm. Enable the customer to, to actually ask you the question right then and there and figure out a way to get those questions answered lightning fast. Okay, Karen, uh, what, the, what about the future of Intercom? I know the company has been profitable in the past. Are you still profitable? So we are really focused on delivering value for customers. That's kind of our, our focus going forward and okay. scaling and growing. Is that a no? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not sharing any, any okay. additional financial uh, metrics well, right now, but we're feeling great about our momentum. What about an IPO? Uh, you know what? Feeling great about our momentum as well. There's nothing specific to share, but as we bring on more and more, particularly mid-market and enterprise customers, um, and see strong momentum, you know, we feel great about the future. You've been great. One last question on that, though: the current market volatility might that impact your timing on an IPO this year? You know, again, we're super focused just on delivering value for customers and thinking about building a great business for the long term. Yeah. And so that's very much our focus today. Well, you've been a great sport, and we look forward to come back and let us know how things are going. Karen Peacock, she's Chief Executive Officer at Intercom, formerly the Senior VP of Small Business at Intuit, and now she also serves on the board of Dropbox. So interesting to hear what they are saying. You guys, you probably use her service. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master, Tim Stanovic, this is Bloomberg Radio.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. So I pull up the top energy uh, menu on the Bloomberg, and we have oil posting a weekly gain, a Saudi Arabia hit by a drone barrage, European gas falling as the U.S. agrees to a deal to cut Russian dependence. There are a lot of headlines on the energy front. We have been talking about energy nonstop for the past four or five weeks. Fortunately, in just a few minutes, we're going to be joined by Bloomberg Intelligence senior oil and gas analyst to break all the headlines down for us. A lot to cover. First up. Let's get to Charlie Pellet. Let's do Let's go the market. Yeah, Charlie. Why not? Friday, we, we turned out to be a mixed day. Let me begin with energy, though. Big story there. I know you guys have got a lot more to say about that coming up in just a moment. Crude up today by two tenths of one percent. Yes, a weekly gain there as well at uh, one twelve fifty eight for a barrel of West Texas Intermediate Crude. Brent, the global benchmark, up a three tenths of one percent today, one nineteen thirty three for a barrel of Brent. The Dow, the S and P higher, Nasdaq lower. Stocks did advance in a choppy day of trading as dip buyers emerged in the final minutes of trading. Treasuries fell with the short end of the curve bearing the brunt of the sell-off. Two-year yield 2.29 percent, 10-year yield 2.49 percent. Spot gold lower today by two-tenths of one percent, 1954 the ounce for the precious metal. Well, as for the market backdrop, Ryan Dietrich is chief market strategist at LPL Financial. He was our guest right here on Bloomberg Business Week. That blast of strength we've just seen recently isn't the hallmark of a bear market bounce, but likely a um, kind of a kickoff of potentially a new bullish cycle. An energy security deal between the U.S. and the European Commission could help jumpstart almost a dozen stalled American liquefied natural gas projects. Think about this end of the weekend here. Pepsi teaming up with the pancake chain IHOP on a new maple syrup flavored Pepsi Cola. What? I would try that. Oh, come on. Yeah, why not? Really? Yeah. Is it like a root beer float or something? I'm, I have no idea. But, I, Carol, I would suggest that with the what? names maple syrup and Pepsi, there's your hint. Mm. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah. Happy Friday, Charlie. My pleasure. All right. Uh, let's get to it because the energy markets, short term, long term, continue to be turned upside down. Shorter term, we know the Russian war in Ukraine and strains on supply have definitely pushed global oil and overall energy prices higher, although we did see maybe, you know, we've seen some back and forth. And then we've been talking so much, Tim, to today about the U.S. and the EU pushing to boost supplies of LNG to European countries by the end of 2022. It's all about helping the EU uh, displace some of that Russian gas. Yeah, the question is, is can the EU actually make up for what Russia traditionally uh, provides the European Union? Fernando Valle is senior oil and gas analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. He joins us on the phone from New York City. Fernando, let's start with that question and, and talk about how realistic it is for uh, the European Union to be able to uh, offset what it tr typically gets and has gotten from Russia. Is it a realistic goal? Well, it, it, it is in the long term, but in the short term, it will be very difficult. Uh, we are nearly maxed out on our capacity, uh, a lot of, uh, on LNG to ship to Europe. Uh, and we have a, uh, we do have some new capacity coming online this year and over the next, uh, next year. But it takes time to, so a lot of that, con that volume is already contracted to other parties. Some are European, but a lot are Asian as well. Uh, that will take those volumes uh, regardless of the directive of the government. Um, and so we'll be able to shift about 10% of the production, uh, which is not enough to, to fulfill the, the, the promise. But over the next few years, as we build more capacity and we shift more of those, uh, th that, those volumes to Europe, we can maybe average down to what was promised in today's announcement. Fernando, help us understand, though, too, because, right, go back... A decade or so, and it was like gangbusters. I was up in the Bakken when you know everybody and anybody was there uh, drilling away, right? All of the fracking that was going on, and we just talked about what this was doing for the U.S. energy situation uh, and geopolitically what it would do for the U.S. as well. So where are we? Um, we talk about it. It's not just a case of just turning on the spigots and everything starts flowing, but help us understand what is the potential for the U.S., in terms of world global supplies, and, and is that kind of where we're heading, where the U.S. becomes a bigger supplier, you know, not only domestically, but really on the global front? Well, you know, it, we, we have become a significant supplier. In fact, the largest producer, even after the 
2020 uh, issues with COVID. Uh, but as you mentioned, we aren't growing back to the 13.3 million barrels a day that we reached uh, in 2020 prior to the pandemic. And there are several issues behind that that will limit our ability to surpass that level. You know, back in 2019, there was expectations that we would get to 17 million barrels a day, which is almost 17% of global supply. Wow. Um, I think that's unlikely just uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, in the short term, we don't have the, the supplies. We don't have the labor. We don't have the equipment. Sand is in short supply right now. Uh, the tubular is good. good. The, 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 the steel pipes that uh, case the wells are in short supply. They more than doubled in price. Wow. And labor, as in anywhere in our, in our economy today, is in very short supply. Longer term, there are different issues, uh, and it's more of a geological issue because we've drilled a lot, and uh, shales is a relatively new development. Fracking really started in 2008. Uh, that's relatively young for uh, oil and gas uh, technology development. And we were having issues with the productivity of the wells that led to this call to this call for capital discipline because we were drilling too many wells too close together. And it's not just capital, but it's actually we weren't we weren't maximizing the resource itself. So I think we're going to have a more gradual pace uh, because of those short term constraints, but also because geologically we shouldn't be at 18 million barrels by 2025. Mm. We should be closer to the 13 to 14 range. So Fernando, what does this all mean for? for pain at the pump. And I should note the daily average, national average gasoline prices from AAA at uh, $4.23 right now, uh, down just a little bit from earlier this month when it was up to $4.33. Uh, because you have this you have this really, and I think this is a really important note that you put out about a month ago with your colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence, about consumer gasoline spending as a percentage of disposable income. Because I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of superlatives are thrown around when it comes to what gas prices are doing right now. But in terms of a percentage of what we're actually spending on gasoline, uh, when it comes to disposable, to disposable income, we were at historic lows. We were. And, and you know, inflation has been so crazy in other parts of the economy. Uh, even today, with oil prices and gasoline prices where they are, it's still well below the 2008 levels. Hmm. So there is more pain that we can theoretically absorb. I know it, it, it hurts really bad when I fill up in my car at the pump. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we haven't even seen the total uh, impacts of Russian sanctions. A lot of crude is shipped. It takes over one to three months to reach destinations. So we haven't seen the full impact from the sanctions that were imposed in mid-February. We'll probably see it in, uh, at, at the end of this month, starting next month. Right. Uh, clearly, China and India are also still importing Russian, gas, uh, Russian oil. Mm -hmm. um, so we won't see a full uh impact, but we'll see some decrease. Right. And then right. one of the things we wrote today was that Just quickly. Russia's lack of access to capital yeah. will see a production drop there as well. Yeah, no, those are all really important points. And as you said, uh, more to come. Hey, Fernando, thank you so much. Fernando Valle, he's Senior Oil and Gas Analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Let's go to Washington, D.C. for a check the latest world and national news with Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nance. Hey, Tim. President Biden is seeing firsthand the refugee crisis emerging in Poland. He visited one town where hundreds of thousands of refugees have arrived as they flee the war in Ukraine. Through an interpreter, Polish President Andrzej Duda thanked the president for the visit and all the security and logistical help. It is a sign and a message that you care about the security of Poland. Today, Mr. President, you met with U.S. soldiers who are deployed here and who watch over our security. They also help in this very difficult work, which is receiving millions of refugees. Duda says building up the eastern flank of NATO is crucial with Russia continuing its attacks. Well, with the war now entering its second month, Ukraine is sounding more determined than ever. We spoke with the deputy chief of staff to President Volodymyr Zelensky, Ior Shovka. We don't have any agreement, any, any peaceful agreement or uh, the peaceful agreement at any terms. We will want the peaceful agreement at Ukrainian terms because we are struggling, we are surviving, we will win. Lior Zhovka tells Bloomberg Ukraine stands ready for serious negotiations at the presidential level. He says they want security guarantees from the European Union, including fast-track membership. Well, it's looking like the Senate Democratic Caucus is unified in backing Ketanji Brown-Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. Senator Joe Manchin, who is often broken with the ranks on Biden nominees in other areas, says he will support Jackson's confirmation. 
Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right. Oh, yeah. This story popped up on our radar. Uh, it's from Bloomberg, Lizzie Burden, and Philip uh, Aldrich. And the headline on it, uh, testosterone fueled bear pit discourages women from economics. The field of economics, our colleagues write, has a, quote, dirty secret that's putting women off in its pursuit of academia. It's a testosterone fueled bear pit. That's according to one of the UK's most influential economic policymakers, David Miles. And it's one of the big reasons, Carol, that the field has been dominated by men, said Miles, who's head of macroeconomic forecasting at the country's fiscal watchdog, which is the Office for Budget Responsibility. Says the guy who's high in economics. Yeah, uh, well... My, I know, no, no, I'm not, I'm just... It's, it's, the thought went through my head. Yeah. Miles made the comments to lawmakers. That was back in December. His observation, borne out by a study of the data in a 2020 survey conducted by the Royal Economic Society, more than 50% of respondents said they found the climate aggressive. Less than half found it respectful, and a third of women said they had been subjected to inappropriate sexually related behavior. This is according to the survey of 181 academic economists. And it's not apparently, Tim, just a culture question, according to our team's reporting. Yeah, women are grossly underrepresented representative in the field. And for those who do stick out, they deal with the widest gender pay gap among professors across subjects at UK universities. I feel like, and you know, there's a quote in here, Victoria Bateman, she's a Cambridge University economist who co-authored an RES report on women in the field. She says, if economics is toxic on the inside, as we draw more women into the subject, they'll be turned off, exit and retreat. And we talk about, right, Creating a pipeline, and yeah. how often do you see kind of you know women come in on the entry level to a certain field, and then as time goes on, they don't, for many different reasons, they're not able to kind of get up to higher uh, positions. It's not a problem that's just limited to the UK. Mm -mm. Uh, the problem, uh, the paper for the National Bureau of Economic Research actually found that female academics in the U.S. were asked more patronizing questions in seminars. In 2018, a Harvard economist, Alice Wu used algorithms to show that there were more references to women's looks in online comments on an economics job forum than men's. Great read. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, a good read, but uh, an unfortunate situation. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Radio.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Stocks advanced in a choppy day of trading. Dip buyers emerged in the final few minutes of the session, with the S&P up 23 points today, up 5 tenths of 1%. For the week, the S&P did advance by 1.8%. The Dow today up 153, up 4 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ, though, losing day down 22 points, down 1 tenth of 1%. Uh, we had the NASDAQ Composite Index today down by 1 tenth of 1%. Tenure yield 2.48% today. The yield on the two-year Treasury note among the most sensitive to changes in interest rates was up 14 basis points to 2.28%. Spot gold down $2 the ounce to 1955, dropped there of one tenth of 1%. West Texas intermediate crude up two tenths of 1%, 112.55 a barrel on WTI. I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, along with Tim Stanovic. Well, earlier this month, we did um, highlight a Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health study. It was uh, published in The Lancet. We highlighted it on the Bloomberg uh, terminal and at Bloomberg.com. What it showed is that the pandemic pushed more women out of jobs than during the early months of the pandemic, reversing decades of progress in education and gender equality. And Tim, we've talked about, too, the pandemic's unequal impact, too, when it comes to minorities. So we have the perfect guest to talk about all of this. That is Bertina Ciccarelli, the CEO of NPower. NPower is an organization with a mission to get people to the middle class from poverty. And the way they do that is by training when it comes to tech skills, and they focus on job placement as well. Bertina, it's good to have you back with us. How are you? Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be here. Well, what, what are you seeing in, in terms of, of what, what Carol just mentioned? Is, is that something that you're seeing day in and day out when it comes to the effects of the pandemic? Yeah, no, it's very real. We have certainly seen women of color in particular mm. disproportionately impacted by this pandemic with a great loss of economic stability um, and rising demands in terms of child care and elder care. So the problem is very real, and I think our opportunity is to identify ways in which we can create better pathways to accelerate another kind of career track that helps these women in particular gain an economic foothold. I love that you said that because if we talk about the inequities that are out there, the inequalities, you know, we we used to talk about income gaps. That's not what it's about. It's about wealth creation, right? And how do you do it? And how do you help those that haven't had the same opportunities be on a better path to help create generational wealth? and so on. And this is something we've certainly seen blacks and minorities that certain haven't had the same access. Tell us about the research you guys are doing and the specific actions that maybe can move black women into positions in technology where it seems like every CEO, Bertina, that we talk to, they want tech workers. Absolutely. It is everybody I talk to in the tech sector right now, it is the number one concern, is a perceived lack of talent. Let's start with what we know and what's really guided our research. Today we know that less than 5% of the tech workforce in America is comprised of women of color, specifically black, Hispanic, and American Indian women. And that's just an astonishing fact. And so we set out with this research really to understand two things. First, what should that percentage be? What should we be striving for as a society? And secondly, what might be some pathways to be able to reach a much more ambitious goal? So what are so those? So that was yeah. how we framed So what research. are those pathways? So, well, I'll tell you our findings, right? The three things that we walked away with this research that we conducted in partnership with Burning Glass is first, and, and this really speaks to that question of a pathway, first we found there are 500 job classifications right now today where there are similar skills, abilities, and qualifications required to do those jobs that are not in the tech sector, but tech adjacent. These are jobs like an electronic medical record specialist, right? An individual who needs to have knowledge of information systems, oh. project management, customer service, quality assurance. And here's the interesting fact in those 500 job categories we mapped for skill similarity, the percent of women of color in those jobs are 10%. 
So our you know, I have to say when you said double the percent. Let me jump in. You said skills adjacent, right? Is that did I get that right? That's correct. I remember. I believe talking about this with the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of um, Philadelphia, Patrick Harker, and has done the same research of saying that there are so many skills that aren't in tech jobs that are are very similar to skills that are needed in what would be classified as tech jobs, and yet those people aren't being shown or provided the opportunity to take that step uh, into that tech community. So so talk to me more about that. So how do we change that? How do we make that better? So I, I think really where we, where we identify this gap, where we know that there are skills that are halfway there and we can go the difference, the distance, is through short-term skills programs, bridge skills programs like Empower and a number of others. And the way we think about this, right, it was important for us to put some dimension around how might we benchmark our success, and that's where the equation for equality comes in. When we have an equation for equality of one, that's when we know the percent of women of color in tech jobs is equal to the percent of women in these tech-eligible jobs, those 500 that I mentioned. Mm So when we get that one ratio, that means that the investments that we're making in bridge skilling programs, upskilling, recruitment, retaining practices, then we will have been successful. So I think the first priority is really to communicate to many of these women who have a lot of those skill similarity aspects, communicate the opportunities through these programs, providing the flexibility so that they can take these types of courses, which are often free, and get the required certifications and skills to be able to be connected to much higher paying jobs. Bertina, is this, a, is this you, you mentioned what happens when we reach that goal and how we reach that goal. Are you optimistic that that happens during our lifetimes? I mean, I, I just look at how slow we have been when it comes to progress within these realms. Yeah, so I, 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 by nature, am an optimist, mm-hmm. and especially now. And the reason, the reason is because there is so much urgency in the business sector on finding great talent and investing in that talent. We have to do it. And, you know, for a long time, we've been very laser-focused as a society, rightly so, on K-12. through And we need to continue to do that. And there are great organizations like Girls Who Code and The Y and Urban Alliance Those efforts need to persist. But we also need to recognize the urgency that today tech openings are up 30% with these short-term programs. We can more quickly position these women to take the jobs that are open right now today. Hey, Bertini. Oh, go ahead. Yes. No, no, please finish. I was just going to say that that electronic medical record specialist, the skills she needs are things like operating systems, network troubleshooting, a little bit of computer and hardware and software knowledge. Again, can all be done through a certification process. Her starting salary as a help desk analyst will be on average over seven thousand dollars a year more. It's a big difference. It's a big difference. Now we got to just remind you know corporations, right, that these these workers are out there, and it's an easy shift for them um, to certainly be hired by uh, the tech community. Bertina, we have to run. Good luck with it, uh, and great to get a check up uh, and just an update on what you guys are doing. It was good to have you back, Bertina Ciccarelli. She's a chief executive officer of NPower, joining us via Zoom from Brooklyn. Last time we talked with her, uh, Shartia Brantley, our deputy. Uh, Bureau Chief here, Assistant uh, Deputy Bureau Chief here at Bloomberg, uh, joined us for the conversation. But it's it's interesting to hear what they're saying. Yeah, and really. Yeah. And then look, it comes just a few days after we spoke to the folks at uh, uh, One Huddle about the uh, upskilling yep. programs that they do. Right, and in just Newark. A, it's an easy shift. A lot of the skills are there. It's yeah. just a little bit of tinkering, and then they can be, you know, have the opportunity to go into a job that pays them more. All right, folks, that's going to do it. Be sure to check out our Bloomberg Business Week weekend radio broadcast at 8 a.m. on Bloomberg Radio tomorrow, podcast as well. Our thanks to our team, Paul Brennan, Sarah Livesey, and a whole team of other folks, Catherine on the board. We couldn't do it without them, Tim. Have a great weekend, everyone. You have a great weekend as well. Stay safe, everyone. You're listening to Bloomberg Radio. 